it goes on to have a big fight outside there. Willie gets all mad because there he had to bail him out, and he said, "You guys should be in jail." But I thought that was a good introduction into our discussion of the gospel and ethics. Let's take a look at uh, Psalm one nineteen, verse thirty to thirty two. I've chosen the way of truth. I've set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, O Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Love that uh, these couple of verses that come out of a very old part of the Bible, the book of Psalms, uh, out of ancient Israel, but there's a lot packed in these three verses. The first that, uh, I want, thing I want to talk about is how the gospel uh, tells us God's word is true. Uh, truth is pretty important, uh, and it's p- probably more important than we really uh, pay attention to in our day-to-day lives. Did you see the story um, came out last week about Blake Griffin and Justin Bieber? Anybody see that story? Well, I, 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 I printed it out for you. I read it just last week on the internet. Here's what, the, what I saw on the internet. It said, police were dispatched this morning to respond to an altercation at a Starbucks in West Hollywood involving some, some familiar faces. A barista at the coffee house was apparently confronted by Justin Bieber when he refused to serve the pop star because he wasn't wearing a shirt. Quote, he came in with no shirt on and his pants hanging down and underwear showing and tried to order a caramel apple macchiato, said Joey Goldsmith, the Starbucks barista. I just told him he'd have to put on a shirt if he wanted to, uh, to be served. That's when Bieber snapped. According to the police report, Bieber started shouting obscenities at the barista and threatening to have his bodyguard kick his blank. Fortunately for Goldsmith, LA's superstar uh, Blake Griffin, who is 6'10", 250 pounds, had been enjoying a drink at a table when he witnessed the altercation and stepped in. Witnesses at the scene reported that Griffin tried to calm Bieber, but the Biebs wasn't having any of it. He cursed at Griffin and then pushed him, and that's when Griffin smacked Bieber, knocking him to the floor. He smacked that blank out of him, said one witness. Then I saw Justin stumble out the door looking like he was crying. Bieber was gone before the police arrived at the scene. Now, don't we wish that that story was true? There's another website called Snopes.com that actually investigates urban legends like that, rumors and myths and misinformation. Turns out that story was false. It was created by a satirical website, a blog, but we certainly wish it was true. Another story came out just after that, last week, that the Russian guy responsible for the Olympic ring malfunction during the opening ceremonies, you know, when one of the snowflakes didn't turn into the ring, that the guy responsible was found stabbed to death in a hotel room two days later in, the, in Sochi. And the story said that he, this guy had like 39 stab wounds, but that Russian authorities said his death was accidental. <laughs> Also a false story. But truth is important. Then there's this Twitter feed that my boys got me onto called Uber Facts. And every day it sends these goofy factoids to me, and I just find them sort of addicting. For example, here's a few of them. The weight of all the ants on the earth is equal to the weight of all the people. True or untrue? A teaspoon of honey is actually the life work of 12 bees. It's kind of depressing, actually. Children laugh an average of 400 times a day. Adults laugh an average of 15 times a day. We try to take care of a few of those here at team in the morning. How about this one? Every year there are 40,000 toilet-related accidents in the United States. Some of you are thinking, I had four or five just last month, you know? (laughs) Men who kiss their wives in the morning live an average of five years longer than men who don't. (laughs) There could be another follow-up to that, actually, that I'm not really going to go there. We say, come on, is that really true? Is that stuff really true? Well, truth is important. And as human beings, we long for truth. Sometimes we settle for information, but what we really want is truth. But what is truth? Psalm writer says, I have chosen the way of truth. I have set my heart on your laws. The Bible is unapologetic about making a claim of truth. The Bible claims to be true. And as a believer in God, as a pastor and follower of Christ, I believe God's word is true. True. That's what team is built on. We tell you right up front, we're going to teach God's word as if it's true because we believe it is. Now, the whole notion of truth is kind of a problem in our modern culture. The problem is when you say something is true, it by definition means other things cannot be true. For example, Blake Griffin either smacked Justin Bieber or he didn't. He couldn't both smack him and not smack him at the same time, right? Story is either true or false. And we have no problem with this in many areas of life. For example, if ma- with math. We don't have a problem with truth in math. Two plus two equals four. Always, never equals five. You don't go to your bank and say, well, I got this statement, and you say I have $1,000 in the bank, but my truth says I have 100 grand in the bank. We, don't, we know it doesn't work like that. Or with gravity, for example. You throw a ball up in the air, it always comes down. You can go on top of your house, jump off, you're always going to hit the ground, no matter how much you think you can fly. 
you know gravity is true. We don't argue with it. But when it comes to moral, ethical, or spiritual truth, a lot of people have problems with the whole idea of truth. And that's because truth tells us that someone else makes the rules when we really kind of want to make the rules. Truth tells us that sometimes we are wrong. And the Bible claims to tell us the truth about God, about morality, and even about ourselves. And this year we've been talking about some of these truths with regard to us and our work. We were created in the image of God. That's what the Bible says. God created us in His own image. We're created to work. But our work is cursed by something called sin. And the gospel redeems us and redeems our work. Uh, and, and God wants to use our work to bless others. We've been talking about all that. And I could build, but why, why should we trust the Bible? Why should we trust the Bible as truth? What about all the other religious books of the world? You have the Quran, you have the Bhagavad Gita, you have the Book of Mormon, and on and on and on. Well, I could build a case for the trustworthiness of the Bible by looking at archaeology, archaeological evidence, for example. It gets stronger every year. For many decades, liberal scholars believe that the figure of King David in the Old Testament was just sort of a legendary mythological figure. His story was just too good to be true. You know, David, Goliath, the whole thing, that he was sort of an ancient urban legend. Well, in 1993, a team of archaeologists discovered the ruins of a stone monument commemorating an ancient military victory by the king of Damascus in the Middle East. And on that inscription is a mention of King David of Israel. At the same time, same location that the Bible claims David existed. So it changes the game a little bit. Archaeology shows this guy really did exist. He wasn't a mythological figure. Or I could point to manuscript evidence. For a century or more, many scholars believed that the Old Testament was unreliable because it had to have been corrupted over about a thousand years. That this text we have today is not uh, close to the text that once was written down by the ancient people of Israel. Well, then came the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 that confirmed vast portions of the Old Testament not only are close, but are absolutely identical to what they were a thousand years ago. So the Bible's trustworthy as a document. Or how the New Testament is hundreds of times more reliable than documents that are widely accepted, written by people like Homer and Julius Caesar. The New Testament's more reliable than those the documents. I could point to all that. Or I could point to moral, ethical evidence that most civilized cultures through human history have been established on moral principles found in the Bible. Either the Ten Commandments are very similar commands. Do not lie, steal, commit murder, etc. Or how they're founded on some of the teachings that are ethically based of Jesus in the New Testament, the golden rule. Most of us can recite the golden rule by the time we're in kindergarten. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But most people don't know that Jesus is the one who said that in the New Testament. Or let him who is without sin cast the first stone. We say people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Well, Jesus said that and taught that as well, guarding against judgmentalism. Jesus said, love your enemies. A teaching so radical it would eliminate racial and religious hatred overnight if it were followed. Okay? I can point to biographical or personal evidence. And my whole family tree was wrenched and turned around and straightened out about 50 years ago, or a little bit longer. My, both my mom and dad are the very first believers, followers of Christ in their family trees. Uh, my dad's father and two of his brothers were alcoholics. Uh, it, it contributed to the deaths of two of his brothers early in life in their 40s. My dad was headed down that same road when he was 15 years old. Uh, my mom's mother was pregnant when she was 15 years old. Her father uh, ran liquor stores early in his life. Both of them heard the truth of the gospel, changed their lives, family tree straightened out, and I'm the recipient of those, uh, those family trees being straightened out. I can point to personal biographical evidence of the truth of God's word. But eventually, Scripture by its own testimony says truth must be chosen. You must choose to believe what is true. I have chosen the way of truth, the ancient writer says. Secondly, today we talk about the gospel tells us God's way is good. Why do we trust it as truth? Because it tells us God's way is good. Years ago when I was doing student ministries, we uh, occasionally, and maybe a couple occasions, did a kind of a game that had a purpose. Sometimes you do games and they have no purpose, but this game had a purpose. We would blindfold a couple of kids and then we'd set up um, the rest of the students in kind of a maze in a big room. So it's sort of a human maze. And the, the, uh, we, we would tell the students who were blindfolded they had to get from where they were standing to a certain destination uh, to get a reward, a prize. Uh, but only one person in the room was going to tell them, the, 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 everybody's going to shout, but one voice was going to tell them the right ways to turn to get to the prize. And they had to determine which voice to listen to of all the voices shouting. So they'd start down this maze, and people would be shouting all sorts of things. Only one would be shouting the true, 
directions, and they had to learn to hear that voice and trust it as they got all the way to the end. And the teaching point was, there are a lot of voices. There's a lot of claims to truth out there. Which one do you trust? How do you know which one is good? How do you know which one takes you to the right destinations? See, we long for truth, but human beings also long for what is good. We long for what is right. And this fundamental longing for rightness, for morality, is seen in all kinds of ways. For example, watch how people act at something as trivial as a sporting event, a high school basketball game, or watching a football game on TV. Uh, our, our, when we see a bad call or something we think is missed, you, people, just, people just get crazy about that. And it's because it seems wrong. We want that which is right. In fact, that desire for what's right has eventually led to the use of instant replay in sports. Because we want to make it right. We want to make sure the ump gets it right. And when it comes to morality, human beings universally see some things as wrong. We just know instinctively that some things are always wrong. Stealing, taking that which does not belong to you is wrong in every culture all the time throughout history. Murder is wrong, taking someone's life. Child abuse, human trafficking, something deep inside us tells you those things are just wrong. I would argue that's the image of God in us telling us these things are wrong. But in other areas, there's all kinds of disagreement. Abortion, right or wrong. Sex outside of marriage, any kind of sex outside of marriage. Use of certain kinds of drugs. How do we know where the lines are? How do we know what's good? What about in areas of faithfulness to your wife? Not with your body, with your eyes or with your heart. What about being honest and ethical in business? Remember the video gate scandal with the New England Patriots? Sorry, Kurt. when they were videotaping a practice and all that, and they got, it was called Video Gate or whatever. Is it wrong if everybody else is doing it? What if everybody else is doing it? Is it still wrong? What if it's a technically against the rules, but is it okay? What about cutting corners that no one will ever know about? What about that stuff? Scripture says, I hold fast to your statutes, O Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Notice two things here. First, God's word, God's truth is intended to protect us from shame. It's very interesting to me. Not only does it tell us what's right and good, but protects from shame. Remember, I don't know how how many years ago, the the original movie City Slickers came out with Billy Crystal in it. But uh, a a great, fun, goofy movie. But there's a scene in there that's very powerful. Uh, One of the characters in the movie is Billy Crystal's buddy, who's kind of a, he's kind of a ladies' man. And he's a womanizer. Uh, He's always talking about women in sort of this way. And uh, they're, they're both on horseback riding, and the guy is challenging Billy Crystal's stance of faithfulness to his wife. He's saying, okay, you're telling me that you would never cheat on your wife. No, I wouldn't. He goes, you're telling me that, okay, if, and he would say, because she would know. He said, well, what if she didn't know? What if she'd never find out? I still wouldn't. He said, okay, you're telling me that if an alien came down from outer space, the most beautiful alien you've ever seen, and was offering to have sex with you, nobody would ever know, then she'd go back into outer space, you still wouldn't do it. He goes, no. He said, why not? That's crazy. He goes, and Billy Crystal's character goes, because I would know, he says. Because I would know. That's because of shame. God's word is to protect us from shame. Secondly, God's word sets us free. Many people think of the Bible as hopelessly out of touch uh, with our lives. That it's a religious relic from a museum that mostly prohibits fun, limits our freedom, and makes us all more judgmental. That's not true. The Bible says it's truth that sets us free, not that limits us. I had a conversation a couple of months ago with a friend of mine who um, told me a story about his professional life that um, kind of, long story, ended like this. His, his company, uh, there was, they faced a lot of, there was, it's a tough world out there. It's tough to survive economically. And his boss feeling that, in, in, inten- that intensifying pressure eventually started pressuring him as sort of the next in command to bend the rules, to do things that he became convinced were, were unethical, and he had to take a stand finally. And he refused to do what his boss was asking him to do because he saw it as unethical and wrong, knowing what the result was going to be because his boss, under that pressure, terminated him. He said, oh, if you won't do it, I'll find someone who will. Now, what I would argue, and what the, my friend told me, is that, that he saw it coming. He said, I still had to do it and because he was free. He was free that he didn't have to obey something he knew was wrong. He had the internal moral freedom to make the choice that was right. God's Word sets us free. And thirdly, the gospel calls us to reflect God's goodness. 
The gospel calls us to reflect God's goodness. I heard a, a story years ago, uh, and this may be an apocryphal story. It's sort of a parable about a um, nine-year-old baseball player named Billy. He's playing Little League Baseball one day in the game. And at one point in the game, he's running from second to third. Uh, throw comes in. He slides into third base. Um says, no tag. He's safe. And Billy, nine-year-old, stands up and goes, no, sir. He tagged me. I'm out. So the ump goes, he's out. Billy gets back to the dugout. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you saying? He goes, well, he, well, he tagged me. I was out, coach. Okay, fast forward later in the season, same, uh, Billy is playing the game, and the same umpire is umpiring this game, and Billy goes to slide in the home plate this time. Umpire goes, he's out. Billy stands up and goes, no, sir, he didn't touch me. He didn't tag me. Umpire goes, he's safe. <laughs> coach comes running out of the other day. What are you talking about? You called him out. You can't. He goes, no. He goes, be quiet, coach. This is Billy. And I know Billy always tells the truth, so go back to your dugout, coach. He's safe. Okay? <laughs> Don't know if that's true or not, but that's a good story. And that's what God wants from us in our work. He wants us to reflect God's goodness. The, uh, Genesis tells us that because of sin, uh, our work is hard. Now, work was created by God as good, a way to reflect His goodness and joy, a way to experience fellowship with Him. But sin comes into the picture, and because of sin, our work becomes toil. Genesis says. In terms of our experience, the curse means that work involves stress and overtime and belligerent bosses and mundane meetings. And not everything in the world of work is as it should be. Work has been cursed. But God is at work to redeem our work. And one of the ways God redeems our work is through His goodness, is through what we would call ethics. Listen to some of these verses. Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? In other words, who, will, who can live with you, God? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, who casts no slurs on other. In other words, the one who walks with God is the one who lives with God's goodness and demonstrates his goodness. Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Now that's ancient business practices. It's using a tilted scale. A scale is tilted unfairly in your direction. It's unfair business practices. God, it's abomination to use unfair, uh, unfair weights before God. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 17, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be full of gravel. Because that's shame. We know, we know when we've been dishonest or unethical. Proverbs 28, 6, better a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Why is it better to be poor with integrity than rich and crooked? Well, one, because it pleases God. Our most important audience is the God who created us. Remember, we work for him. You don't work for your boss. You don't work for your company. You work for God. He's the audience we are interested in pleasing. Secondly, because work done appropriately, work done with, uh, with goodness, blesses others eventually. The purpose of your work is to bless, bless others. And thirdly, it preserves a good reputation. Preserves a good reputation. Uh, this past week I had lunch with a guy, executive level uh, 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 man who, whose company in a long story was actually just was taken over in a hostile takeover. He gets to work on, I think it was on a Thursday, have a meeting. They say, don't bother coming in tomorrow. Your company's been bought. You're all gone, all of you. It had nothing to do with his success. Very uh, a good employee, great track record. Nothing to do with profits. It just was a hostile takeover. You're all gone. Don't need you. So now he's in a job search. But as we had uh, lunch, and he's talking about it, he said, um, within 24 hours of losing that job, 24 hours of that devastating news, he was getting calls from associates, people he'd known over the years, even competitors saying, hey, you need anything, you, need to find, you can't find something, we'll work out something for you because we know who you are and know how you work and your reputation is good with us. He said, I realized that all those years of treating people with respect, all those years of doing my work the right way had produced a reputation that at the end of the day was more valuable than a great resume, he said. That's why our work that's how our work reflects God's goodness, and that's why it's important. Questions around the table today. Three of them. Uh, first, what was the primary place where you learned right from wrong? Was that a big focus at home? Was it at church? Was it at school? Was it something else? Or was it some combination of those? How did you learn ethics? What's the foundation of your ethical life? Uh, secondly, have you ever seen 
or been asked to participate in something you believe to be unethical in your work? Ever witnessed it or been asked to actually participate in something? Thirdly, have you ever lost business or lost a job because you refused to compromise your own personal values? Just interesting questions. Talk about them around the table. I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock. <laughs>